man from history. Ibn Sina, born in the month of Safar in the year 370 AH, was of Persian origin. It's worth mentioning that many scholars and great figures in our history came from various regions, as Islam does not differentiate between Arabs and non-Arabs. Everyone served this religion without discrimination or distinction. His father and brother were followers of the Ismaili sect, which was a branch of Islam. They introduced some of their own ideas and established the well-known Fatimid state. However, Ibn Sina did not accept this sect and rejected their doctrine. He had an independent stance and once said, I hear and understand their words, but my soul does not accept them. From a young age, Ibn Sina was well versed in the memorization of the Quran. He also showed a keen interest in the science of grammar starting to study it at the age of 10. Later, he shifted his focus towards the study of medicine and decided to dedicate his life to this field. He greatly emphasized the study of medicine and engaged in extensive medical and scientific exploration. After choosing medicine as his passionate field, Ibn Sina focused on it, acquiring in-depth knowledge and benefiting from the experiences of esteemed scholars in the field. He would read medical books and delve into the subject with remarkable speed. What is striking about him is that he considered medicine to be one of the simpler sciences. He would say that medicine is not difficult at all and that it was evident that he excelled in it quickly. Despite starting his medical studies at the age of 16, he rapidly progressed and soon became a master in the field. Ibn Sina continued his study of philosophy and logic. His initial studies in these sciences were under the supervision of Abdullah al-Naini, known as al-Muthalath. It appears that this scholar was not proficient in the fields of philosophy and logic. Therefore, based on his exceptional intelligence and remarkable abilities, Ibn Sina decided to surpass the ordinary level and learn from the best scholars in these fields. He advised young people not to settle for average teachers, but to learn from the greatest dimensions these sciences possess. Then, they should observe how they can build upon and go beyond what has been achieved, God willing. Then, Ibn Sina temporarily abandoned the study of philosophy and began independently reading books that he couldn't find someone to teach him in the field of philosophy. He faced difficulty in studying philosophy, despite finding ease in studying medicine, which greatly puzzled him. He firmly believed that God facilitates for each person what suits their inclinations and abilities based on their created nature. Therefore, he spent a long time in understanding philosophy properly. Eventually, the opportunity arose for him to acquire books, and he read again about logic and all branches of philosophy. During this period of his life, he would say, When I studied philosophy, I wouldn't sleep for a whole night, and I would only get very little sleep. I would only focus on learning the sciences of philosophy during daylight hours. I couldn't possibly cover all the available books before me. Ibn Sina said that understanding Aristotle's book, Metaphysics, was extremely challenging for him. He read it 40 times, yet he couldn't comprehend it. Then he read the book by Al-Farabi, which covered the same subjects, and through it, he understood the intention of Aristotle. He admired how Al-Farabi presented a better explanation of Aristotle's ideas compared to Aristotle himself. Ibn Sina became renowned for his philosophy, but in reality, he was even more profound in the field of medicine. Therefore, I always advise young people to determine their primary area of interest. Other fields can be secondary interests or hobbies, and dedicating oneself to a single field helps them achieve their goals and excel. Ibn Sina lived in tumultuous and uncertain political circumstances during the decline of the Abbasid Empire, known as the Second Abbasid Caliphate. However, I would like to emphasize an important point, which is that political and cultural situations are not always interrelated. Sometimes there can be cultural progress despite political disruptions. Therefore, when politics collapse, it does not necessarily mean that civilization collapses as well. There may be a connection, 
but it is not always the case. Ibn Sina had a wonderful approach when he was confused about a certain matter. He would turn to the mosque and pray. He would humbly beseech God until what was closed to him would be opened, and what was difficult would become easy. Indeed, he possessed some spirituality. In the end, as a weak human being, resorting to God and seeking his assistance is something you must do. It is also circulated that he used to say that when he returned home at night, he would place a lamp in front of him and continue reading and writing regardless of his fatigue or feeling tired. Does he resort to sleep when he feels drowsy? No, he does not say this. Instead, he states that he drinks a cup of water or any other drink to regain his energy and then resumes reading again. He drinks juice until he falls asleep. Oh, young people, you will not become great except by taking yourself seriously with determination and not surrendering to sleep and comfort. If you reach the pinnacle of success in the field of medicine in a short time, and despite the struggles in philosophy as mentioned, Ibn Sina benefited from his early brilliance in medicine. He had a love for goodness and treated patients out of a desire for their well-being and to benefit from knowledge. He believed that this knowledge should be given to people and viewed it as a duty and obligation rather than for personal gain. He began treating patients and gained fame for curing diseases that others couldn't treat. His skills became renowned to the extent that rulers took notice. When Mansur Ibn Nuh al-Sulaimani, one of the princes, summoned him to treat him for a disease that other doctors couldn't heal, Ibn Sina's reputation grew. He recognized his lord's wisdom in this being Mansur Ibn Nuh. The doors opened for him, and he was granted access to the library of Prince Mansur. The libraries, volumes, and manuscripts of that time were filled with cultural treasures. Ibn Sina would eagerly approach them and read one book after another. After the death of Mansur Ibn Nu, his son Nu Ibn Mansur al-Sulaimani took the throne, and Ibn Sina received support and attention from him. Thanks to this support, Ibn Sina's life stabilized both mentally and materially, and this had a positive impact on his productivity. It is truly a mercy from God that when a person enjoys mental and material stability, they begin to excel and innovate. Here, it is upon our rulers and merchants to provide suitable conditions for scholars so that they can focus on learning and education to elevate the nation's level. Thanks to this material and mental stability, Ibn Sina was able to achieve remarkable accomplishments in the field of science, especially in medicine and psychology, and he contributed greatly to these fields. Ibn Sina wrote numerous books in various fields such as natural sciences, engineering, mathematics, chemistry, and others. Among his famous books are Kitab al-Arsad al-Falakiyya, Book of Astronomical Observations, which is one of the greatest and most famous medical books in history, and Kitab al-Kanun, Book of Law. However, later political disturbances occurred, leading to Ibn Sina's imprisonment due to his association with the ruler who lost his power. After his release from prison, he disappeared and moved to a friend named Ibn Galeb al-Attar. Nevertheless, Ibn Sina continued to research and write, producing numerous books on subjects such as natural sciences and theology, including Kitab al-Hayawan, Book of Animals, Kitab al-Nabat, Book of Plants, and Bidayat al-Muntaha, the beginning of the final quest. Most of his books were written during the period of forced political isolation imposed on him. Ibn Sina's personality and contributions are undeniable, and he had a readiness to explore the deepest matters and delve into their details. Discussions on language occurred between him and a man named Abu Mansur al-Jaba'i. Ibn Sina's weakness in understanding the language became evident, so he took an interest in studying it intensively for three years to compensate for his lack in this field. It was remarkable how a distinguished scholar could be unfamiliar with a language, but it was clear that al-Jaba'i had more knowledge of it. In a peculiar move, Ibn Sina learned the Arabic language with all its intricacies, composed three poems, and used ancient and unfamiliar words in Arabic in these poems. Later, he wrote these poems on papers, and then swallowed them, and published them in a way that made them appear as a very ancient book. Then, someone handed this book to the Caliph, and al-Jabai was present, so the Caliph ordered al-Jabai to explain it. 
Al-Jabai tried to answer but failed, and Ibn Sina, who was actually the author of these poems, explained them. Afterward, he revealed to them that he was the one who wrote those poems, and they believed they had discovered ancient poems. It is a wonderful example of a generation that challenges challenges and does not surrender to the unknown. They work on learning any knowledge that is difficult for them, even the private information of their specialized field. Ibn Sina was fascinated by astronomy. The chief Sheikh Ibn Sina worked on studying astronomy for eight years, and during this study, he sought to understand what was written by Ptolemy and other scientists. He wrote a book called Al-Insaf fi al-Arsad, Equity in Astronomical Observations, at a remarkable speed, as it encompassed his extensive scientific knowledge that spanned from one field to another. However, the greatest achievements of Ibn Sina are associated with the field of medicine. Ibn Sina adopted a unique methodology in practicing medicine, combining meticulous observation, systematic experimentation, and the utilization of previous experiences. He was the first to make several important discoveries, concluding that diseases can be transmitted from one person to another. He was also the first to describe meningitis and discovered the roundworm, eight centuries before it was discovered by an Italian physician. He accurately described the malignant smallpox disease, which was used for terrorist purposes and others. He was also the first to delve into the issue of stroke or sudden death with precision. Additionally, Ibn Sina specialized in pharmacy, where he discovered a range of drugs that stimulate heart movement and developed anesthesia methods to be used prior to surgical procedures. He was also one of the early Muslim scholars who focused on psychotherapy and rejected the notion that therapy has no effect on neurological disorders. He studied in detail the diseases of love and their impact on human beings. His interest was not limited to medicine alone, as he also had a fascination with natural science. He discovered that light travels faster than sound and discussed the effect of airwaves on hearing, highlighting that without airwaves, it would be difficult to transmit and hear sound. He also invented a device for measuring lengths with high precision. Despite his numerous contributions to knowledge and science, medicine remained Ibn Sina's primary and prominent specialization during his time when his books were translated. Ibn Sina became a renowned physician for four centuries. It is well known that Ibn Sina's book, al Kanun fi Al-Tib, The Canon of Medicine, became one of the fundamental references in European universities, where it was studied in several universities until the end of the 17th century. This book was read alongside another book by the prominent physician Galen, considered the main reference in the universities of Vienna and Frankfurt until the end of the 16th century. Since chemistry is related to drugs and drugs are connected to medicine, Ibn Sina played a pioneering role in the field of chemistry. He had a great interest in minerals, similar to Jabir Ibn Hayyan, and delved into studying the composition of minerals using his own methods. He produced drugs and medications by utilizing the chemical knowledge he acquired, and many discoveries in this field can be attributed to his contributions. He mentioned several chemical processes in this context, including distillation, filtration, sublimation, and crystallization. In addition, he had his own devices and a laboratory for chemists, just like Al-Razi and others. Ibn Sina's views on education were not widely known, but he was a scholar of education and expressed educational opinions in several books in Arabic and Persian. Most of his educational views can be found in his book titled Kitab al-Siyasa, The Book of Politics. It is not intended to be understood as politics in the usual sense, but rather refers to the policy of child-rearing. One of the prominent ideas mentioned in this book reveals his educational doctrine, which is that education is not limited to a single stage, namely a child's entry into school. Rather, his discourse on education extended to encompass the child from the moment of birth until marriage and participation in social life. His concern was not only focused on one aspect of education, but rather emphasized the completion and integration of a person's character, encompassing the mind, body, and emotions. These educational theories of Ibn Sina were influenced by his understanding of Islam from the Quran and the prophetic traditions, Hadith, but he also drew inspiration from Greek philosophy. Ibn Sina sought to support his views with medical, psychological, and philosophical justifications. He combined philosophy, education, religious understanding, 
and integrated them with the understanding of the human psyche to present his educational theory. He also highlighted the stage prior to a child's entry into school as an important phase that shapes their future personality. In this early stage, the capacity to acquire good and bad habits and behaviors lies. During the first seven years of a person's life, which is the period of childhood, their character is built and shaped. Ibn Sina had alluded to this long ago. In terms of teaching methods, Ibn Sina paid attention to individual differences among students and encouraged cooperative learning. These theories that are advocated today in the West are, in fact, the theories of Ibn Sina. He called for guiding students based on their inclinations and talents instead of placing them in the same school, class, and curriculum. How wonderful it would have been if schools today adopted the theories of Ibn Sina in their guidance. Ibn Sina also emphasized the qualities of a teacher in his educational theory. Regarding Ibn Sina's contributions, he was an independent figure who achieved considerable success in his lifetime. Despite holding positions, his travels to various lands, and his involvement in wars and local conflicts, he managed to write numerous remarkable books. Ibn Sina had numerous writings, to the extent that his output can be recorded as consisting of around 100 books. Despite variations in their quality, each book reflects his knowledge and understanding in various sciences of his era. He was dedicated to his work even in difficult circumstances. Most of his books are still preserved today, and many of them have been translated into Latin and printed in different languages. His book, Al-Shifa, The Book of Healing, serves as an encyclopedia in the field of knowledge, comprising 18 volumes. The complete original version of the book is still preserved at the University of Oxford to this day. This book covers a comprehensive range of topics, encompassing all aspects of philosophy at that time. The book Al-Shifa covered studies in metaphysics, psychology, logic, ethics, politics, and aesthetics. It served as a fundamental reference for philosophers in the Islamic and European worlds for several centuries. It has been translated into numerous languages and is still studied in universities today. Al-Shifa is considered a significant achievement in the history of philosophy as it collected and organized philosophical knowledge available at that time. It provided a comprehensive study of philosophy in all its aspects, paving the way for the development of philosophy in the Islamic and European worlds. The impact of Al-Shifa on Islamic and European civilization has been immense. Ibn Sina passed away in Hamadan in the year 1037 AD at the age of 57. He was a polymath who contributed to various scientific and philosophical fields, leaving a profound impact on Islamic and European civilization. He is regarded as one of the greatest thinkers in history. from history.